I just remember thinking, this is crazy. Like my, my daughter died yesterday. My daughter is dying today. Like this is the worst thing I've ever been through. And having this baby close to me, whatever magic is happening, skin to skin is like, I remember thinking I'm crazy. This is the happiest I've ever been. This is Nikki Baby's Parent Support with Katherine Whitaker, a podcast from Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit that provides free personalized support, resources, and community before, during, and after a NICU stay. My conversations here focus on education and personal stories with medical and hospital professionals, counselors, therapists, and NICU moms and dads from across the country. So whether you're preparing for a NICU stay, you're currently there, or you're months and years past your stay, you belong here. The NICU is hard. We're here to help. I'm your host, Katherine Whitaker, the mom of six children, including my very own NICU baby, and I'm so grateful that you're here. Howdy, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. I hope that you've been enjoying and taking a lot from this particular season. I have really loved the conversations, the uh, the vulnerability, the practical tips, all the things. Today's episode means a lot to me. I don't often get the chance to visit with someone that I know in real life and love deeply. And that is my guest today. It's not an easy topic that we're talking about. We're also talking about death in the NICU via twin to twin transfusion. And I think that Laura's story will leave you feeling hopeful. And I think that the words that she has to share with you come from a place of deep healing, but also of deep feeling. And there were a couple of times that I had to pause, but Overall, it is such a poignant, beautiful conversation and one that I have wanted to have truly for a very long time. I think you'll hear me share in the interview talking about her writing, which is, I use this word, exquisite, because it is, it's powerful and moving and lovely and amazing and all those other words. But exquisite, I think, really captures how Laura shares hard pieces and parts of her life with the world. And I think that really comes through in our interview. So I hope that you love this one as much as I did recording it. My guest today is Laura Kelly Finucci. She's an author, a speaker, and the founder of Mothering Spirit, an online collaborative project on parenting and spirituality. She's authored seven books, including Everyday Sacrament, The Messy Grace of Parenting, and Grieving Together, A Couple's Journey Through Miscarriage. Laura and her husband live in Minnesota, where they are raising five sons and remembering their twin daughters, Maggie and Abby, who died in 2016. So with that, let's have a beautiful conversation. Well, it is not often that I get to look across the screen. I know some of y'all are watching this on YouTube, but it's not often that I get to look across the screen and see someone that I just love in the world. Laura, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Catherine. It's a joy to be with you. Well, you are an amazing human being, and I have so many more questions and not enough time. But I think we should start with this, because I think that you are one of the most exquisite writers that I know. And I'm curious, how is it that you found this passion for writing? And how has it become such an important part of what it is that you do? Okay, I became a writer because I was so stressed out as a new mom. Like I was completely overwhelmed, and I needed an outlet. And this was back in the blogging days. So I thought, I'm just going to start a blog and I'll have a little creative outlet. Like I have this newborn. I had just finished grad school. So I went from like all these friends, all this like great conversation stimulation to having a newborn. And so I just found that writing like saved my life in those new mother's days. It just became this outlet and it gave me so much life that I'm not one of those people that set out to say, I wanted to be a writer since I was like six years old. No, I feel like it found me and it gave me life. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept doing more and more of it. And it was like little by little doors opened. And it just was one of those callings that kind of like the path opened before me. So, but truly it was because I was just a hot mess as a mom and really needed to put some words to it that, yeah, that I wound up where I am today, which is pretty wild. Well, thank you for being obedient to that because not everyone would be like, hey, I'm going to do this little back in the OG blog days, right? Um, I had a blog too. It was super fun. But 
you communicate things and and give words to things and experiences, Laura, that I think many people have gone through or will go through. And I think that they are a bomb. So thank you for being obedient to that gift, because I know that it serves your family in a beautiful way, but selfishly, it serves many other people because of your words. So I'm really grateful that you, that you. you did that. So I'm going to take you all the way back to 2015 when you found out that you were pregnant with twins. Did they run in your family, by the way? No, these are so identical twins don't run in families. It's fraternal twins that okay. like a woman might release two eggs every month and you might get fraternal twins, but identical twins can happen to anybody. Like it's just <laughs> they can happen to you. Okay. They can happen to you too, friend. <laughs> so but there were definitely no no history of twins anywhere. So that was like not even on y'all's radar to begin with. Not even in the least. Never okay. thought about. I remember saying to my sister, twins would be my worst nightmare. Can you imagine having two newborns at once? Like watch when you open your mouth in this world <laughs> because then you're in that ultrasound room and the tech's like, oh, oh. oh. And then it was like a blue streak of very colorful language that I let loose because I was so floored, had no expectation, no idea it was coming. So was the pregnancy developing typically until you found out that you had twin to twin transfusion? I mean, did you have any indication that it would be anything other than, I mean, I hesitate to say typical twin pregnancy yeah. because they are, they vary so much, but I guess leading up to that diagnosis, normal pregnancy? Um, Not really. It was high risk from the beginning because with identical twins, you don't know, do they, there's different kinds of, of like setups sort of that you can have with identical twins. And the first risk is, do they share the same sac? You can have identical twins that are, I believe, mono, mono, which yep. means they share a placenta, they share a sac. And so first we had to do all this screening to try to find out, oh my goodness, are they in, you know, do they have their own sacs or do they are they sharing one? And I remember that ultrasound where we found out, nope, there were two little bubbles. They had their own sacs. And I think that I thought, oh, phew, well, that's behind us now. Everything will be smooth sailing from here. So we did have a lot of extra monitoring and a lot of extra ultrasounds. And I couldn't go to my normal midwife because I had to be with this, you know, high risk OB. So yeah, it was kind of from the very beginning, as soon as we find, found out there were twins, there were a lot more because this twin to twin transfusion can be a risk with identical twins. So it was sort of always wow. on our radar from the very beginning. So when did you find out that you had it and what did y'all know about it? Yeah, well, I remember they told us about it from the get go. Once we realized they were mono dye twins, which means they um, shared a placenta, but they had their own sacs. And they said, this is a, this is a rare complication with identical twins. Um, and what happens in twin to twin transfusion syndrome is that they essentially have like shared blood vessels in the placenta. So when the placenta is forming, sometimes it doesn't form as it should. And so our girls had, you know, they had blood vessels that were shared. So one twin was not getting enough blood and one twin was getting too much blood. Yeah. So that can affect how they grow. It just can affect what their system can handle. Cause obviously humans, we need just the right amount of blood, like not too much, not too little. So yeah, they told us all along this could happen, but we also knew that there are plenty of, there are treatments for it, right? Like you can have in utero surgery, sometimes it just resolves itself. So, I mean, it's, it can be very serious, but I remember being in our the maternal fetal medicine and they had right there on the wall, a story about a local family that had had twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Mom had in utero surgery. Everything went fine. She had a full-term pregnancy. Babies were born thriving, doing well on the, you know, wall of the doctor's office. So even though we knew it was a risk, we still thought, oh, it could turn out great to turn out just fine. You know, why worry about the worst case scenario? So we did know all along it could be a thing. We just, of course, didn't think it would happen to us. Right. Isn't it interesting what the body remembers? Like you can go back and remember things, things seemingly small, and you look back and you remember it crystal clear, exactly mm -hmm. where you were, what you saw on the wall. I find that such a, an interesting caveat to everyone's story. Yeah. So what did y'all do? When did it become critical that they were like, now we need to intervene? Yeah. So it was probably about halfway through the pregnancy. I want to say 16 or 18 weeks they realized, you know, from an ultrasound that it looked like the blood flows were such that the girls were developing this twin to twin transfusion. So then started probably 
three weeks, I think all told three, four weeks of constant monitoring. I mean, by the end, we were going to the hospital every single day with a hospital bag, not knowing were we going to do the surgery? Was I going to have to go to the hospital that day? Were we coming home? Were they going to have to be born early? Were they not? So it was so, I mean, and we had three little boys already at the time. So it was like every single day we would pack up, you know, before dawn and get in the car and go to the hospital and have no idea what the day would bring. But twin to twin transfusion syndrome can be like that. It can literally, there's all these different stages with it and you can change stages within a matter of hours. So it was like, we had to be monitored that closely. And, and of course we all know with, you know, with babies, you want them to stay in there as long as you can. So they were really trying to buy as much time as they could to just hopefully give them the best chance. So yeah, we had like I said, three, four weeks that were just awful. Such a roller coaster of like, is it going to be today? Is it going to be tomorrow? Oh, it's a little bit better. Oh, it's a little bit worse. I mean, we all know what that's like, right? I mean, that's just that part of life that we all get into in the NICU too. But yeah, so it was just a lot of monitoring until it got to the point where the doctors finally said, you know what, it's it's really serious and we do have to do, we have to try for the surgery was a laser. How many, how many weeks were you? They were 24, just okay. like had just turned 24 weeks. Okay. And so it's a, a laser ablation where they would try to go in and sever the connected blood vessels in the, in the placenta. And like I said, a lot of times, you know, moms can have that and the twin to twin transfusion is totally resolved and they can go on and have a healthy pregnancy. So that's amazing. Right. And I knew stories like that. But what happened with our surgery was that there was a bleed in one of the baby sacs as they were trying to get in there and sever the blood vessels. And so they weren't able to sever all of them as they needed to. And then, you know, that bleed, they they were able to stop the bleed. But by the end of the night, it was very clear that the girls had to be born like they couldn't stay in. So that same day, I went back into surgery and had a C-section and they were born at 24 weeks. And, you know, again, even then, like we all know those success stories, right? You hear yeah. every story about, and again, with the pictures on the wall, like you said, those are burned in my brain. I remember the hallway down to the NICU had all these big star photos, all the stars of the NICU. And you feel like, oh, I've heard this story, right? Like my baby's going to be this micro preemie, but they're going to go on and they'll be like valedictorian at Harvard, right? Like this can happen right. and we know it can. So I remember... My husband saying afterward, he's like, I remember when the girls were born, I thought, okay, now is where medicine takes over. Now is where medicine is going to save them. Like you just think, okay, they're really, they're early, they're brand new. They they should have been baking for, you know, half a pregnancy more, but here they are. But in our case, the twin to twin transfusion syndrome was really far progressed. So, I mean, it was clear from that first night in the NICU that it was going to be rough for them. They were just like, it was, they were really sick as every neonatologist would tell us. So yeah, it was a really rough day and really hard from the get-go with what we were facing. That feels like an understatement, Laura. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you just, you know, there's miracles though, right? I mean, I think that's part of what I think is incredible about just human resilience, right? If we didn't have that hope and if we didn't have that understanding that things can happen at any step along the way that we don't expect, like, I don't know how we would keep going, you know? So yeah, but I mean, I mean, it was, it was the worst case scenario, right? It was what everyone hopes won't happen. It was that call in my hospital room. And I remember when that phone rang and I just looked at it and I was like, I hate this. I don't want to pick that phone up. I know exactly what they're going to tell me. You know what they're going to say. Yeah. So, um, our, you know, our daughters were just together in the NICU the one night Maggie lived one day and Abby lived two. So, I mean, it just felt like an absolutely impossible task to have to go in there and make those decisions and, you know, decide finally that it, as the doctors were telling us, it was just too far progressed and to have to take them off the ventilator and to hold them, I mean, two days in a row to have to say goodbye to two babies. Like it's just, it, it was just more than anybody should ever be asked to bear. 
you know, and and I remember thinking the first time I heard after the fact um, about another family that had lost babies to twin to twin transfusion, I got so mad. It was almost that irrational, like, mm. wait a minute, that happened to us. That was so bad. That should never be allowed to happen again. And the hard fact is it happens. You know, most of our babies, they go to the NICU and they come home. And I've had a baby yeah. that that happened with too, you know, and thank God for that. It's amazing. But it does happen. Like life is just so fragile. And for these little ones that are coming into the world with a lot of complications and and a lot, you know, of odds stacked against them, it's just the reality that that is how some of our stories end, you know? Yeah, I want to read. Um, I want to read that. You didn't know that I was going to do this. I wanted to read. You wrote this. It's so beautiful. And I think people need to hear it. Yeah. So you wrote, hold on, let me get this up here. I want to make sure that I give it. You said Margaret Susan and Abigail Kathleen, which beautiful names, by the way, Thank you. were born on Saturday evening via C-section. When we finally got to sleep late that night, they were stable in the NICU. By Sunday morning, they were not. We spent Sunday afternoon holding Maggie as she died in our arms. People say that there are no words for this, but there are. They are just achingly hard words. People say that parents should not have to go through this, but they do. It's just overwhelmingly awful. But what everyone agrees upon is that having to do this two days in a row, having to hold two children while their breathing slows and their hearts stop is unbearable, beyond the pale, nothing but nightmare. I'm here to tell you that it is not. I would love for you to share the rest of that, Laura. I think that I have read that so many times, just that excerpt. And I mean, I, I said it at the beginning that you give words to things that people feel but yet don't know how to express. Yeah. Yeah. What happened was I remember the, the second day when we got the phone call again and you just feel like, you just feel like we just walked through hell. Like, how are we going to walk through this again? And I remember just my husband pushing me in my wheelchair down to the NICU. And I just was like, this is more than can be asked of any human. Like, how are we going to do this? And when we got to the NICU, Abby was more stable than Maggie was. So we knew we had more time with her. And one of her nurses said, do you want to do skin to skin with her? And I remember thinking, absolutely not. Are you kidding? I did skin to skin with my babies when they were brand new and we were going to be nursing for the first time. And I just felt like this is too tender. This is too hard. I can't do that with this baby. I'm going to have to say goodbye to, but the nurse was really insistent. And you know, those NICU nurses, like they are angels. They are so wise. They are so strong. And you learn pretty quick, like they're running the show too. Right. So you need to listen, like they are your guides through this place. Right. And so she wouldn't give up. And I was finally like, all right, I'm ready. We will. Okay. We'll do skin to skin. And you know, it's a lot of work when you've got the baby on that. Yes. The biggest. And all the cords and oh yes, my and all gosh. The it's yes. like all hands It takes on seven deck. people. Yeah. <laughs> so much. So this whole procedure to get, to get Abby ready for skin to skin. And when they put her on my chest, it's like, there's part of me that can just feel her there all the time. It just, it was like, everything in the room changed. Like, I, I just remember thinking, this is crazy. Like my, my daughter died yesterday. My daughter is dying today. Like this is the worst thing I've ever been through. And having this baby close to me, whatever magic is happening, skin to skin is like, I remember thinking I'm crazy. This is the happiest I've ever been. And I kept thinking, okay, I got rational, you know, I got all scientific. I was like, well, this is like when you get your baby and you get that oxytocin, oxytocin rush, right? And I've had babies without drugs. So I know when you, I mean, God bless the epidurals. I've loved yes. them and could have kissed an anesthesiologist too. But the one, the two that I had without drugs, I know you get this crazy rush. And I was like, yes. okay, this is just my body doing something really nice for me. And giving me this rush, but it didn't wear off. And I finally opened my eyes and I could see that my husband was feeling the same thing. And I'm like, we're losing it. This is where we're not only like going through this, but we must be losing it because how are we feeling this? And we finally started talking about it. And I was like, I don't feel sad anymore. Like I, something happened when she got laid on my chest and all I feel is this joy. And he was like, you're going to think this is crazy, but I feel this too. Like whatever happened in that room was beyond 
what I had words for, what I even understood, like my faith could make sense of. Like it was phenomenal. And I remembered that nurse and it was like this for hours. Like it didn't even fade after 20 minutes. By like at one point, my husband, I was like, do you want to hold her? Like, I don't want a baby hog here. He's like, yes, of course I do. And as soon as he put her to his chest with the help of, you know, the team of eight, like right. I saw the same thing happen on his face. It was this total calm, this peace, this joy. And I was like, what is going on? I remember the nurse coming back in and she was like, can I take your guys' picture? Because this is, what's happening here is wild. Like, and I can see it too. And I'm in here every day and I don't see things like this. So, I mean, I still, I think about it all the time. I still think some days I have good words for it. Some days I can call it all kinds of beautiful, holy things. And some days I just think, what kind of mystery was that? You know, because again, it wasn't like, I call it a miracle. It was the closest thing to heaven I feel like I've ever felt. But also like, it didn't save Abby's life. You know, we she died right. later that day. And so I wrestle with it too, I think dang, that was the happiest I've ever been. And also I would give that back if I could have my girl here, you know, like right. there's, there are just things that we, it, we just can't make sense of it. Right. But I feel yeah. like there was, there was a gift in that day that I thought was just going to be like the second worst day of my life. Something totally other happened. And I think What's wild to me is that as I've shared that story, like I've written about it or when I go and speak about it, you know, people come up afterward and they'll say things like, I had something like that. And I've never told anybody because I thought they would think I was crazy. You know, I maybe I felt that at my mom's grave after she died, or maybe I felt this thing in the hospital with my baby or my loved one. And like, it doesn't make any sense, but I felt that like the whole room turned peaceful. There was just this grace there. And I think, you know, as much as our stories of like suffering and pain and loss are so hard to share, but important to share. I also think this other category of story is something else too, because when you go through something so hard, you know, even if it's not some big moment in the hospital like that, like there will be these moments of just grace or love that surround you that you never could have expected. You know, like a stranger will say something to you one day and you're like, what was that? How did that person know just what I needed? You know? So I just think, yeah, yeah it's amazing. The things we can't explain, but they're just as much a part of the story. Well, I will share the rest of that story in the show notes because it's certainly worth reading. Laura, I would be remiss if we didn't pause so that I could say thank you for sharing your hardest day and your yeah. second hardest day um, with all of us. I know that there is a mom or a dad listening who will be grateful that you did. This podcast is produced by Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit, but we're more than simply a podcast. Be sure to download our app in the Apple Store or on Google Play, or you can visit our website to discover all the ways that we can support you as a NICU parent at handtohold.org. You can join one of our support groups, sign up for counseling, find loss and bereavement support, request a peer mentor, or check out our educational resources and family stories. And all of that is at no cost to you. You mentioned that you had three other boys at home. Laura, how did you navigate grief with your spouse and also with your children that were at home in those first few days? Ugh. My husband will always say, like, we wouldn't have gotten out of bed if it weren't for those three little boys because we got home and it was like people needed dinner and permission slips and clothes for tomorrow. And part of you is grateful for the things that keep you going. But I mean, the first days of grief are the hardest thing ever. I mean, you just you feel like you're underwater. You feel like there's this gorilla sitting on your chest, you know, like you're never going to come out of it. And I, I think you go through the motions to get some things done, but I mean, it's just total devastation. And when you lose a baby like that, like I had a C-section, so I was just recovering from, you know, this massive surgery, my milk's coming in, oh, like gosh. it's, it's everything that under any other circumstances you have with birth. And yet you're having to do this with, you know, no babies in your arms and everybody's grieving around you. Like it's just the absolute hardest thing. So I think part of me is just like, I don't know how we made it through those first 
few weeks, but I think we were surrounded with a lot of love. We had those boys pulling us out of bed and there's just a sense of like, you just have to put one foot in front of the other. Even if all you do is literally get out of bed and go make yourself a cup of coffee and then go back to bed. Like that's all you have to do for that day. So I think, yeah, you have to let other people care for you, which is really hard. And I think, you know, realizing like as spouses, we grieved really differently. You know, I'm a person who loves words. I wanted to talk about it all the time. And my yeah. husband is an engineer, like he's a gardener. The man loves to do stuff with his hands and, you know, he's wonderful and will listen. And we talked a lot, but like he wanted to go do so. He started ripping up our front lawn. Like I'm going to make the girls a garden. He's like, Rip. okay, we're doing something constructive with our grief. And so I think having just a ton of grace and compassion for yourself and everybody who's going through it because it's a mess. You know, the the kids were grieving. The grandparents were grieving. Everybody knows like our tempers are not great when we're tired and stressed out. So there's a lot more yelling than there normally is. But I think the thing I wish I would have known in those first few days and weeks, even months, was that it wouldn't always feel as awful as it felt then. Like, I remember thinking, am I going to feel like this forever? Is this what my yeah. life is? Like, I'm always going to be this sad. I'm always going to be this angry or this jealous of other people. Mm. And, that, and I, grief changes, you know, it never goes away, but you learn to live with it. And I think what, what would have helped me is to know that it would change and I would learn how to carry it. But also, mm, this is where it's going to get me, that I would never not miss them and I would never not love them. Like that I am delighted. I would be delighted in a weird way to tell right. myself all those, you know, eight years ago is that they are as much a presence in my life today as they were then. And I think I I worried that that wouldn't happen either, like that that I would not think of them or would they be forgotten or would other people forget them? and. No, they're always part of our family. Like we talk about them all the time. So I think both parts of that were true. It wouldn't always feel just as that absolute hell that you're going through then in raw grief, but it also, the love part would never lessen. Like they're just as much with me as they were then. I was going to ask you what surprised you most about grief, but I think you just answered that question that this, uh, I think we fear when we love someone and they're no longer with us that we fear that the part of us that loved them and remembered them will somehow fade away along with our raw pain. Um, yeah. And I think it's a comfort to know that that's not the case, you know, that that love continues. Um, and maybe, you know, I had a, a, a good friend tell me some things are not meant to be understood. They're just meant to be pondered. And I was like, oh, that feels like one of those things that we may ponder for a really long time. How did you, how did you guys share that? How do you continue to share that, Laura, with your other children? Mm -hmm. The ones that weren't born yet and the ones that were, how do you share their lives with them? Yeah. So we always remember their, like their birthdays and the anniversary of the day that they died. We always like really honor those days. You know, we, we light candles and we talk about them. We look at their pictures. We, you know, we'll go to their, to their grave and bring flowers or just, you know, be there together. We also just make it special. Like we get, you know, a cake and we get, have a special dinner for them because we want the kids to know, like, they're always part of our life. And, and we believe that we're going to all be together one day. So who we are as a family will always include them. But, you know, like, we still have younger kids too. So we do like, you know, bedtime prayers or prayers on the way to school. We always include Maggie and Abby in those. And um, so it's beautiful. You know, we have their pictures around the house or we have things with their names on them. So like, they're just kind of woven into our lives. And I think it's beautiful. Sometimes I'll see when the kids bring home stuff from school, you know, they'll include them in their drawings or like their list mm -hmm. of who's in my family. And so I think, you know, we try to to help our kids to understand that like what love is or what family is is bigger than what we can see and know right now and yeah that i mean you know grandparents or great grandparents that aren't with us anymore like that doesn't mean that we don't still love them and that they aren't 
part of our family that, like you said, there are some things that are bigger than we can understand. And love is one of those, but like love doesn't die, you know, that changes and that relationship changes, but yeah, they're always going to be part of our family's life and our family story. And yeah. So I think that just becomes kind of a natural, like normal part of a family's life. We've been blessed to know so many families who've lost kids. And I think yeah. that, you know, seeing the the examples and the models from other families about how they like weave them into their life together has helped us so much because you realize we are far from the only ones who've gone through this. You know, there's this whole web of folks. I mean, that's one of the other things that surprised me was like, once I shared this story, how many people seem to come out of the woodwork, especially in older generations and would have stories of losing babies that I never knew before, you know, older relatives or people in school or community. So I think, wow, like there are a lot more people who understand this than I ever knew. And, and we, we sort of carry each other through that, I think. Well, I think when you share about them, it gives other people permission to share about the people that they love, you know, this, uh, this ability to, it sort of makes them feel like they're still present. You know, when, when people share, like, I think sometimes people are afraid, like, do you ever find that, Laura, like people might be afraid to mention them to you because they are afraid that maybe they might make you sad or that it might be hard for you? Like, what would you encourage people? Like, I think maybe it's yeah. a myth of grief about, oh, it totally oh, oh don't, is. don't mention the girls. Yes. Yeah, don't, don't bring it make... up. <laughs> like, I'm thinking about them always. I feel like it's like a current underneath everything. Right. And, and nobody ever can remind me of them. And if, if, someone mentions them to me in a way that's that's beautiful and that does touch me and makes me cry it's only in a way that's like a beautiful affirmation of being seen like you can't remind me that my children died i know that right. you know but it's just right. like i mean in the way my house is quiet now right like all five of my boys are off at school thank god but um i'm still thinking it right they're always like in the back of my mind they're always like a presence with me even though they're not right here running around right and i feel like it's like that with our twins too like they they're always it's like it's a half inch under the surface of whatever i'm doing so i think it's actually a real gift when you speak the name or you just mention like the child that someone lost because it is like you said it affirms that that child's not forgotten, right? That yeah. they are remembered by other people. They're missed by other people. And my gosh, I have one friend who like would text me every month on the girl's birthday on the 27th, oh. just a quick little like, just thinking of you and the girls. It took like, what, 10 seconds of her day. But I felt so loved and so seen. And there were so many months where I just thought, oh, Kate remembers them too, you know, like Aww. I'm not alone in this. And I think there's so many beautiful ways that we can help other people know that they're seen in their grief and that we're all going to experience grief at some point, you know? Right. So the more yeah. that we talk about it and we support each other through it, it's just such a gift. What does it look like? Like if you had to sort of encapsulate what grief looks like today, eight years later, what does it look like for your family? And what does it look like for you personally now? Mm. There's never a time that I see little girl twins that I don't think about it. And like, those are the moments that my husband and I will text each other about. I'll be like, oh, there are these babies at church or there were these girls at the soccer game. And so I think, um, you know, twins are not uncommon now, especially since so right. many people, you know, do IVF and things like that, that can increase the risk or increase the likelihood of twins. So there are lots of, I mean, there's moments every day that I think I get that little pang of, oh, it would have been so different. It, I, I miss them. I wish it would have been so different, you know? Yeah. But I think I also have learned that hand in hand with the grief I will always carry is gratitude for their lives, for the chance to be their mom. I mean, I would, I would still do it. If I got the chance to go back and, and that feels crazy, but also true. And I think I have real gratitude for the life that's also grown up, you know, afterward and around it, that, that we got the chance to have a baby after that kind of loss, because that's no small thing and no, it's a risk to love again, you know? So I think I, I learned to carry more 
you know, because that grief is always there. It's there at every milestone. It was there when they would have started kindergarten. It'll be there when they should have graduated high school or, you know, when they should have gone to college, all of that, that we won't get to do with them. But it also makes me so grateful for the, just the sheer gift that is life and to get to be here at all. Once you know how fragile life is and what it is to witness death, you just are in awe that any of us get to keep going at all. So I think I have learned to hold all of that together in ways that I didn't know how to do when, when that was not a part of my life yet. I love the way you say that. I love the life that has grown up around since they were gone. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think there are a lot of moms that, that may listen to that and may, um, and may feel really seen. So Laura, as you, I'm going to circle back to the writing portion of your story. How has that changed in the last eight years of, of what you share? Because I know that some of what we experience is TMI and we keep to ourselves, but some of it we choose to share with the world. I'm curious what's sort of grown up around that grief in your writing. What I think is amazing is the times that I choose to share something in my writing from my grief. That's often what people connect to most. I mean, sometimes I'll think, oh, it's this beautiful thing or it's this wise thing I think I have to share. But sometimes it's just the raw fact of saying like, this really hard thing happened and I cannot put a tidy bow on it. It just is what it is. And it feels impossibly hard some days. And that is what so many people know of grief, even if their grief is very different from mine. So I think being willing to be vulnerable in my writing has allowed me to connect with other people in a way I never imagined. I think, I think I probably thought, you know, say 10 or 20 years ago that being a good writer was like about the skill, you know, of having this beautiful way with words or having a really like just a laser view of focus on the world to be able to say things. And now part of me realizes that the risk of being a truth teller and the willingness to be vulnerable in ways that feel safe, you know, not sharing everything, like you said, but, but being willing to share some of those broken parts of my life and my story are actually, that's the most powerful writing because people are coming to someone's words to feel seen themselves, to make sense of their own sense of brokenness or their own grief. And so ironically, I think we think, oh, isn't vulnerability a bad thing? Like you could get hurt, but I think Vulnerability is actually what builds community and connection and compassion. And so I think it has really taught me that all the beautiful words in the world aren't really worth the same as saying to someone, yeah, I I have been in a really hard place too. And even if our stories don't click together like puzzle pieces, there's so much that we can know of each other through our willingness to share a piece of that. Well, I think there's a lot of times that I've gone through something difficult, but I'm too afraid to share how I really feel. And when someone that I trust and know and love shares something and they share it from a place of healing, but they share it nonetheless, I find that that is incredibly healing to me too, because you start to wonder, am I the only, not just am I the only one feeling this, but is it wrong or is there something wrong with me? if I feel this or if that thought has come like even even the beautiful parts, like even the joy that you shared earlier, I am grateful that you felt brave enough to share that because I think that that helps people heal. Um, So I think it's, I think it can be a really powerful thing. I love asking this question at the end because I love people's advice. Laura, if there is a mom or a dad listening and they are experiencing the greatest loss, what would you want them to hear? I would want them to know they're not alone because that was one of the things I felt so strongly. I didn't know anybody else that had lost a baby like that. And it felt like this was not the way our story was supposed to end. But what you learn when you go through this is there are actually so many people who know what it's like, an unfortunate number of folks who will be able to wrap their arms around you, even from a distance, even online, however you can connect with them. And I think knowing that you aren't alone is like the first step of realizing you can keep going. Because when you see someone, I remember 
we went to this great support group that our hospital put on for parents who had lost a baby in pregnancy or birth in the first year. And I remember one time they had this panel of parents, someone who was a year out from their loss, five years and 10 years. And it was such a gift to hear from them, like the ways that their grief had changed, the way that their child was still part of their life. And I think I remember leaving that meeting thinking, oh, I won't be alone the whole way. It's not just for right now where I need this support group and these other parents that I can just sit and cry and tell dark humor jokes in this hospital basement to get through the day. But also knowing like five years from now, 10 years from now, if I meet another parent who's been, who's had this experience, like we're going from zero to 60 in our conversation and our friendship. And that happens all the time. Like you can just be, you can understand where someone else is at. So I think knowing that you're not alone is huge. And like I said before, knowing that the way you feel right now, it won't always feel the same. You will feel grief, but it won't feel that heavy or raw or hard. It will change over time slowly into something that that you can hold and that your love will grow right around it and that baby will never be forgotten. I think all of that, yeah, that's what I would want to press right into their hands. Feels like a good way to end it. Laura, thank you for the gift of your wisdom, but certainly the gift of your writing. It's a really beautiful piece of the world that I'm glad that we get to experience with you. Well, in today's two-minute take, I don't know what else I can add that Laura didn't already say. You know, there was one thing that she said. We circled back to it in the interview, but it really did. I, I wrote it down because I think that it really did strike me that she's grateful for the life that they have created around the loss of their girls, that she's proud of that. And I don't know, maybe you're listening to this podcast and perhaps you're the one that's experienced the greatest loss, or or maybe you're listening to it because someone that you love has experienced the greatest loss and you don't know what to do. You don't know how to love them. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to be present. And I think it was this understanding of who you have become and the life that you have created because of this very hard, very difficult, greatest loss has happened to you. I think that gives us some perspective. You know, Laura is an exquisite writer. There are so many things that I have linked to in the show notes that I think you will find some deep healing from. We mentioned it that I think some of the most important things that we hear at least vulnerable things that people share from the the hardest parts of their story, but when they share them from a place of healing, how healing they can be for us too. And I think that was the overarching message in today's interview is that this healing can come from so many different places and that you are not alone. It will not always be this difficult, but, you know, take heart in knowing the beautiful life that can come from your loss and how it will change and affect you and how it will color the world, how it will allow you to see with a different perspective, the preciousness of life, but also how you can help other people through their darkest and hardest days. So we have so much more coming on the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can watch us over on YouTube and listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, but give us a rating. We're always happy to receive those and don't go anywhere because next time we have great conversations continuing. And this is a little bit about what you're going to hear next time. Advocating is a boundary. Like, and people maybe would not look at it like that, but it is. It's saying, I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to make it a point to understand everything that's happened with my baby. And that is my right. 